Good morning, Westside Church. I'm Ben Fleming, the Generations Pastor here, and uh, we're just excited that we get together today on the especially most special, wonderful of Sundays, Super Bowl Sunday. Um, they put me up here on purpose on these weekends. Uh, I got a bold prediction for you. Chiefs by 18. It's not going to be close. It's bad to get bet against Tom Brady, but I'm feeling confident. Um, some might even say it's the spirit, but it's not. <laughs> not so bold prediction uh, is that God is with us today. Um, and I know that as we continue to be scattered and gathered in various places throughout our community, I am more confident than ever because of the tie that binds that is the Holy Spirit that we are gathered in the presence of God. And there's power in that. There's comfort for those who mourn in that. There is victory for those who feel like we're losing in that. There is grace and mercy and forgiveness in that. And here's the best part of all that. And let's keep this in our hearts as we worship is that is available for all of us. So if you're feeling like you don't belong, like you're excluded, like you don't feel it right now, well, I promise the Holy Spirit, the presence of God is greater than all of our feelings or perceptions. He is with us today. Amen? Amen. So those of you in the room, why don't you stand with us? Those of you who are worshiping from wherever you're worshiping, you can worship however you choose to worship. But Father God, we know that you're here. We're confident, Jesus, in these moments that even if our minds aren't always there and even our spirits aren't always there, Lord, we know that you are here with us. You're in our midst as we gather, Jesus. So we, we gather around that today, around that banner, not our own ideas, but instead, Lord, we engage with you. We receive your blessing. Jesus, pour out your spirit. In your great name we pray. Come on, and everybody said, let's worship together.
That's our prayer this morning. We want more, we want more, we want more. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I
worship you this morning, Jesus. You're so faithful, God. So even in the midst of us singing of our need for you, you're faithful, God, to meet us right where we're at. We thank you, God, for who you are, for how you work, for how you love us, Jesus. And this morning, Lord, we want more of you. We need more of you, God. We want to learn more of who you are, God. We want to become more like you. So I invite you, Holy Spirit, come and have your way in this place. In every home, everyone watching, no matter when, when they're watching, would you meet us right where we're at, right now, Holy Spirit? You're so good, Jesus. We just worship you this morning. We give you all that we are. We don't hold anything back from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're in the room, you can have your seat. We're going to continue our worship through our giving today. And there's a place for you to do that online as well. There's a link you can click on somewhere on the screen. And we just want to say thank you, Westside Church, for your generosity. You never cease to amaze us. And it's because of you, your generosity, your obedience to the Lord, um, your worship through your giving, that we are able to help so many, to meet so many needs in our community, not just here in our church, but far reaching. And how amazing that we can sow into not just the kingdom of God, but our city, our community, those who have real needs. We get to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. So let's pray as we prepare to give. Jesus, we thank you for allowing us to partner with you, for allowing us, God, the opportunity to help, to be your tangible love, Lord God. We just pray that all that is given today, Lord Jesus, you would multiply. Would you cause it to go so far, much farther than we could ever cause it to go, Lord Jesus. Be worshiped through our giving today, Lord. It's not just with our songs, it's not just with our words, but it's with every dime that we give to. We love you, Jesus. You're worthy of all that and so much more. Receive it all. It's our love to you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi, my name is Kimberly, and here's what we've got coming up here at Westside. Parenting has never been easy, and today's changing world presents many obstacles for families. Our Westside Parenting Summit is a new resource to equip and encourage families. Included is our interview with NFL Hall of Fame coach and best-selling leadership author, Tony Dungy. Dungy is the father of 10 and offers unique insights into leading and parenting. Go to westsidechurch.org slash parenting summit to watch videos from speakers addressing a variety of issues we all face as parents. Experiencing loss and walking the challenging path of grief can be one of the most isolating and painful places to walk. Westside is committed to coming alongside those facing grief with meaningful support, resources, and hope. Our grief support group is led by compassionate people who really do understand. Beginning February 21st, this 12-week group will provide healing and tools to help you find steady ground in uncertain times. To find information about this ministry and many others here at Westside, please visit westsidechurch.org slash events. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Now, water baptism is a symbolic act because you're declaring to yourself, to the people that are watching you and to God that I am dying to my way and I'm coming up to His. And that imagery is so important in the way of Jesus. And I don't know about you, I wanna live a new life. I wanna be free from the things that kind of tie themselves to me. 
Water baptism is a declaration that I will not allow the things of my past to constrain the work of God for my present and future. As always, we've got a lot happening here at Westside. For more information on all of our events and ministries and to catch up on Sunday services, visit westsidechurch.org. Hey everybody, it's great to have you with us today and welcome to those that are in the room and those that are online. And we're in a series called The Beatitudes, On the Beatitudes. And uh, as Pastor Bo talked about last week, uh, this is God's map for us to experience a happy, uh, fulfilled, and beautiful life. And I don't know about you, but I need a map for that. It doesn't just come naturally. It doesn't just happen. Um, and, and yet we have, a fi- we have a hard time kind of finding it on our own. And I think about the culture that we're in right now and everyone, everyone else has a map for your life as well. Uh, how to experience happiness and fulfillment and everyone has an opinion about where your life should land. And, and so who do we listen to when we uh, want to build a life that looks like Jesus. And so that's what this series is all about. Uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter five. In essence, it's his thesis statement for how to, how to have this beautiful and abundant life. And it's opposite than what you think. And, and, and you, have to get, you have to get your mind around this, that it's, it's, it's counterintuitive from the way our culture uh, believes that we experience happiness and fulfillment. It's, it's, it's opposite than what most other map makers would, uh, would describe the way to happiness. It feels upside down in a world where we're at the center of it. And uh, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about a movie years ago. There was a movie about um, the first test pilots to break the sound barrier. Nobody thought it was possible to go 735 miles per hour. And in the movie, the test pilots realized that when they got to that speed, um, the controls worked backwards in their plane. So, so they would pull the stick back and it would make the plane go down, not up. And, and in the movie, once they realized that, they were able to break the, through the sound barrier. But it's not it's not historically accurate, by the way. Chuck Yeager denied that, that it's not how it worked. But I was thinking about that movie in this message because it serves to illustrate what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes. He's taking the controls of how we experience, how we break through the barriers to experience happiness and abundant life, and he's saying they work backwards. When, when you think you're supposed to pull back, you're supposed to go forward and that kind of this, and it helps us, if we get our mind around this, it helps us to live into his kingdom, which by the way, is unlike any other kingdom. It's unlike the, it's, by the way, it's unlike the American kingdom. It's unlike the, the, uh, the Israeli kingdom. It's unlike the uh, Jewish kingdom. It's unlike uh, Arab culture, Eastern culture. It's just, an, it's just completely different. There's, we try to find similarities here and there, but this kingdom that Jesus describes is absolutely, completely backwards from everything that we think and know and understand about life and what's up is down and what down is up. And so you're gonna see that today and through this rest of this series, the Beatitudes. Describe uh, who Jesus wants us to become. And so if you have a Bible, you, know, you can follow along with me in Matthew chapter five. We're just gonna hit two Beatitudes, the first two today. And, uh, and this is who Jesus wants us to become. It's, what's his, it's his vision for his people. Um, how to, how to, what are the eternal characteristics of his kingdom, his way, his path? Um, and this is how the kingdom works. And so this is, this is his map for our lives. Let's look at Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit, this is a really interesting phrase in the original language. It means to be empty. It means to, uh, to be someone without assets, um, without options, without power, to be poor in spirit. It, de- it describes people who are 
who are not spiritually arrogant. Um, Luke also, in his, um, in his writing of the Beatitudes, he actually leaves out the phrase in spirit. He just, he just says, blessed are the poor. And some, some people feel like he might be referring to actual poverty materially. Um, and, but most scholars believe that he's, he's descri- what he's describing and doing that and leaving out in spirit is simply saying that these, these people who are poor uh, in spirit, poor uh, in poverty, they describe people who have a sense of dependency, that they can't make it on their own. Um, they have a sense of humility. Maybe that's been brought about by their circumstances. And so throughout the Bible, as you read through the Bible, it's interesting when you think about this idea of people who are poor in spirit, people who are impoverished, what you see is is both spiritually and materially, you see people, these people are under God's protection. It's, It's backwards. It's like these people are, God fights for the underdog. That's what you read in the scripture. He's, he protects those who are impoverished. Often, uh, you see the poor often turning to God. You see those who are oppressed looking for deliverance. I'm telling you, it's backwards. The controls are upside down in this world. We think, see, because we think having excess gives us security. But Jesus is telling us that the only thing that can give us true security in this life, true happiness, true fulfillment, is in him. And his kingdom, what did he say? Seek first my kingdom and then all these other things will be given to you. Yet we seek all these other things and if we have time, we seek his kingdom. You see this backwards, it's, it's upside down. One of the stories I love that Jesus told was of a man who gave a great banquet and it's, it's a parable and um, it's this, 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 this scene of this party and this, this man has like put everything together. He's got all the food and huge table and he invited all the people, all of his friends to come and join him. And, and what we find in this story, it's found in Luke chapter 14, what you see in this story is that all of his friends had excuses why they couldn't come to this man's party. And one, one guy had to buy a field, one guy had to go get married, one had bought some oxen. I guess if you buy some oxen, that makes you pretty busy. I don't know, you're not able to be at the party. And, 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 and so he, he tells this story, and then look at what Jesus said, the man said, after hearing all these excuses, the host, right? He hears all these excuses from his friends, and this is what he says, the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, check this out, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame because these are the people who inherit the kingdom of heaven and I don't think it ha- you have to be materially poor to enter into God's kingdom for our lives but those of us those of us who have resource are often tempted to be ruled by what we already possess and not have a sense of dependency upon God we, we have a tendency to be ruled by the, the, the things that we have or that we want to have and this materialistic kind of ideology. And, and, and listen, I, we have what we need. In the United States, we have what we need. We had, I mean, we had a banquet last night. I'm good. I don't need to go to another one. And by the way, I'm busy. I don't have time. I've got other things going on. And see, to be poor in spirit is to recognize, regardless of what we have or don't have, that all of life is in God's hands. I'm not in control. Maybe you want to just whisper that to your soul right now, just to remind you. I'm not in control. And the Beatitudes, rather than causing that to to, to allow fear to emerge in your life. The Beatitudes, Jesus is saying, no, listen, listen. If you live in, with a sense of dependency upon me and a sense of being not in control, you'll inherit my kingdom, my way. And Jesus promises that if you seek his way, he'll provide all these other things. And so this is the idea of being blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will enter into God's way. Let's look at the second one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, some scholars think that this means um, that those who, are, those who mourn over their sin or their brokenness, and that's not really in the text. I mean, you can mourn over that, um, but that's not the primary emphasis here. What the primary emphasis here in this, in this beatitude 
is what God does for those who mourn. What God does for those who suffer, for those who are in uh, distress, for those who are frustrated, for those who are disappointed, God says that those people will be comforted. God isn't saying, by the way, be happy when your life sucks, <laughs> okay? He's not out of touch with our reality. Jesus is acquainted with our sorrows. He's not saying just buck up and be happy when everything falls apart in your life. Sorrow is not something we need to run to, to inherit God's kingdom. We don't need to look for it, <laughs> but we shouldn't run from it. Pastor Bo, uh, as we were talking about this message, she gave me an antithesis to this beatitude that might actually help kind of understand it more fully. She told me, unfortunate are those who resist experiencing and expressing sorrow. They are closed to the presence of, a, of God and alone in their pain. See, grief and loss are something all of us will endure in this life. Jesus said it, in this life you will have trouble. But in his kingdom, those who experience grief and distress and sorrow and frustration, they will be comforted. We're gonna look at that word in just a moment. It's a promise from Jesus to all of us, that those of us who have experienced, who experience sorrow in this life will be comforted. The question for us that I wanna spend the last few minutes on is how does a life of mourning and comfort and being poor in spirit lead to happiness? I love how the message translation um, describes, kind of translates Matthew 5. Let me read it in the message translation, these two beatitudes. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. Backwards. Doesn't make any sense. The controls aren't working right. Gotta wrap your mind around this. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. It's backwards. It doesn't make any sense in this world, but only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. This is what I know and what I've experienced, what I know so many of us have experienced in these days that God embraces us in our weakness. God's presence is more real in those places of dependency upon him. But sometimes, even though God wants to embrace us, sometimes our arms are so full with other things and other concerns. Peter reminds us in his letter to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God by casting all our anxieties upon him because he cares for us. He's there for us. See, these two beatitudes, to be poor in spirit and to mourn, are anchor us into God's presence through Christ. In a sense, these two beatitudes are kind of the, re are the basis for the rest of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. They, you could kind of think of them like the legend of the map. They're, they're, the, they're the things that kind of help you interpret the rest of the narrative, the way that in which we read the rest of the map. To truly understand it, we have to understand that those who are poor in spirit, those who understand their dependency upon God are the ones who inherit the kingdom. A couple of things that this, this describes for us. One thing that we need to do and one thing that God does. The first is that we need to empty ourselves. Empty ourselves so we can see the fullness of God's rule and reign in our lives. What should we empty ourselves of? Ourselves where we're not at the center of our story, but he is. See, in a world that doesn't need God, who, who do we depend upon to fully live into the way of Jesus? We must empty ourselves of ourselves. We are but clay, beautifully crafted by our creator, wonderfully made, but we are clay, vulnerable and easily broken. When I was in Bethlehem 
years ago and I visited the church of the nativity, the entrance into the church is only about four feet um, high and, and it was built to keep looters out um, so they couldn't easily get in and out, but it seemed appropriate as I was walking into the church of the nativity, that place to honor the coming of God in the flesh, that you would have to stoop to bow before entering. Paul recognized this in his own life and in his teaching. He describes this life of emptying ourselves. In Philippians chapter two, verse five, he writes, think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. See, Jesus is telling us that everything in his kingdom begins and ends with those who understand and have realized and who are experiencing their need for a God. It is the entrance into kingdom living, a sense of dependency and poverty. It's not thinking of yourself too highly or too lowly. I want us to be careful that we don't like start beating ourselves up, right? But there's this sense that I've had most of my life that I am bankrupt without him. I am spiritually destitute without God. I need him. And I'm so grateful that his mercies are new every morning. And this recognition anchors me to him and his presence. Regardless of if my my life is going great or or if I'm in the depths of despair, I'm anchored to him because I know I need him. So we empty ourselves of ourselves. And then Jesus comes along in the emptying of ourselves and he empowers us to embrace suffering in ways that draw us deeply into his presence and causes us to hear his voice. Those, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. That word comforted is the Greek word paraclete. It's the exact word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another paraclete, another comforter that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Just imagine this, that those who mourn, you're blessed. Why, why, would, why would mourning and suffering be somehow a blessing, a, a pathway towards a fulfilled life, towards a happy life, towards a sustaining life? How, how can mourning actually lead you to experience abundant life? It doesn't make any sense. And the answer is, is, is in you. It, it, the very presence of God abides in those who have followed who follow the way of Jesus, he lives in you. And I tell you, when you go through difficulty, it's like the spirit of God is activated in your life where he shows up and embraces you and helps you to to understand that he is with you, that God is with you. You are never alone. See, the reason why Jesus tells us that those who mourn, those who suffer, those who struggle are blessed, are happy, are fulfilled because it's in those places where we experience more of the presence of God than at any other time in our lives. Where you sense his abiding presence. 
as Jesus' people, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and when we weep, he comforts us. We are blessed in those moments because we know we're not alone. You know, as a pastor for almost um, 30 years, <laughs> Susie, Susie, we're getting old. I mean, I'm getting old. You're still young. Young as a spring chicken, girlfriend. <laughs> But, but as a pastor for almost 30 years, I've walked with a lot of people through suffering and, uh, and aloneness and brokenness. It's, it's pervasive. And, um, and we run from it. We run from it. Um, we don't like, we don't like going to see people in the hospital. We don't, we, we, we've, and we've created all kinds of things to help us not get sick, and um, it's. And I'm okay with all that stuff. By the way, I just, I just, I just think we run from it. We try to avoid it, and so when suffering and heartache come, we don't know. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to find our way through it. It's, and I've found in my own life personally, but also walking with people who have experienced deep brokenness, it's a sacred place where heaven and earth kind of come together. It's painful and beautiful all at the same time. It, we know that that it's the most unlikely place, but it's the most intimate place that we've ever experienced God is in our suffering. Pastor Bo encouraged us last week, she said to trust Jesus with our suffering, but most of us, if we're drawing the map for our lives, we will draw it around suffering rather than through, through suffering. We'll do, this, is, this is to avoid that altogether. But Jesus invites us in, to join him in those sacred spaces where poverty and sorrow welcome us into his presence. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. I want to ask you if you've given your life to Jesus in his way. You might say, well, yeah, I did. I did when I was a kid. I mean, I, you know, somebody, some Sunday school teacher asked us if we wanted to receive Jesus and I raised my hand. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a daily decision to submit your life to his map making. To say, I'm in this with you wherever you lead me. I can't do this life without you. I I, I can't find my way without someone above it all guiding and directing and filling me with his spirit and helping me understand his presence is near. I need you. So have you given your life to Jesus in that way today? And will you do that again tomorrow? a daily decision to follow the way of Jesus, to enter in through the low door, to pray as Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours, oh God. Would you be willing to pray that with me today? Just say this out loud, wherever you're at, whether you're in the room or whether you're watching online, would you just whisper these words after me, Lord, not my way, but yours. Jesus, your kingdom come and your will be done in my life as it was in your life. Jesus, we love you and we need you and we can't do this without you. 
And blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Help us, Jesus, to empty ourselves today of ourselves. Help us to, help us to lay aside and lay down and give to you our anxieties and our stress and our, and our frustrations and to trust you in this life, with this life. Help us to, to, to walk in your way and to seek your first your kingdom. Help us to, to experience today, Lord, your presence, your spirit comforting us, guiding us, directing us, being with us. Help every single person that is hearing my voice to, to experience your life-giving presence right now. In Jesus' name, we need you, Lord. We need you. In your precious and powerful name, we pray, Lord. Amen. We love you all and uh, keep pressing into Jesus. We'll see you next week.